Okay. So we do have sound. And now reactionary tactics to the industrial city. In response to the conditions of the industrial city, um, there were sort of three new things that emerged, and these extended on into the 20th century and sort of altered cities in uh, profound ways. The first that we've already talked about is a public park. Uh, today we will talk about parkways and suburbs. Um, there is a heavy influence here by Frederick Law Olmsted and his partner Calvert Vaux, V-A-U-X. Um, if uh, it's French, and uh, if, it, if he was French, it would perhaps be pronounced Vaux. But since he is English, uh, it's actually pronounced Vaux. So we will use Boston as the example where the park, the parkway, combined to create uh, something that we rightfully would call a park system that was intended to shape metropolitan growth for the emerging metropolitan city. Boston was um, a Puritan settlement, and like all of the other Puritan towns, it had, um, now why is there no signal over there? Laptop, laptop. It's because I have that screen on VCR. There we go. Um, this area that we see here is actually the common. And then we see house lots around it. And uh, you'll notice that it's actually a peninsula, almost an island. In fact, at high tide, um, the, the, this spit of land that connected it back to the mainland was known uh, and was known as Boston Neck was actually covered by the tide at high tide. This area that we see over here was a very large embayment of Spartina Marsh and tidal, a tidal estuary um, known as Back Bay. Boston, um, certainly more than because it was a port, it had a deep harbor here, um, actually was one of the first of these Puritan settlements to sort of um, break with its intended um, idea of isolation, and it became the uh, import-export capital of New England. The um, area that we see right here was extended out and, and became known as Long Wharf, and is still there. Uh, though the working harbor of the port has moved up the coast um, to the Mystic River, which is actually north of Boston. Um, there was a, a river that uh, was associated with this tidal estuary in Back Bay, which was known as uh, the Charles, is known today as the Charles River. Water supply for grinding of grain water power came from a dam that was constructed right across here so that on the incoming tide the gate would be opened and uh, this would fill up. The gate would then be closed at the peak of high tide and then a sluice was cut uh, right through here that could actually then, um, when the tide went out, they could open the gate on this end and because this was higher than this, the water would run this direction, and that would turn wheels for the purpose of grinding grain and so forth. Uh, there we actually see this, which was known as Dock Square later when it was filled in. Almost from the get-go, 
uh, Boston began to undertake a series of landfill projects, uh, first filling in a lot of these estuaries to make more uh, docks and harbors and things that were associated with shipping. The uh, first uh, public building was actually located here, which was at the intersection of the High Street, which is today known as Washington Street, that ran on that thin neck of land, that sand spit that connected it back to uh, the mainland. So it was really at the intersection of the, there we see Long Wharf, the intersection of sea transit and land transit that we see here that, um, that the public building, the State House, was uh, actually constructed. This is Bonner's map of 1722. And we see the common here, but we also notice that people have begun to plant trees on it. There's a large deposit of gravel up here, a mountain really called Beacon Hill, which contained a lighthouse uh, warning ships coming in that they were approaching the harbor. Uh, Boston Harbor has a series of islands in it. Uh, even today, when you land in Boston at the airport, um, pilots will tell you that it's one of the scariest places to land because the airport is out in the middle of the ocean <laughs> and you're just dropping the plane down into blackness, down into the darkness. Uh, this is Washington Street today. And just of a minor side note, this is the Old South Meeting House, which was the site of the Boston Tea Party where they ran down the street. It's right there. Ran down the street and out on the Long Wharf and dumped all the tea into the harbor uh, in defiance of the tax that had been placed on tea that they were importing from England. There was no way they could produce their own tea. Um, and that's what it looks like today. It would develop in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as the major retail street. So Filene's, all the major department stores were located along Washington Street. Now Boston uh, did not grow as rapidly as New York, but it grew rapidly, as you'll see from the close of the war with England, uh, where it had a population of about 8,000. It grew to 560,000 in half a century. And there you can see um, these wharfs, the old wharfs that were built, and then this was all filled in. There's Long Wharf extending out into the harbor. And then the mill pond that we see up here, which today is actually the site of the Boston Garden, where the Boston Celtics uh, and the Bruins play. Um, well, you can imagine that many people crowding on to um, this little spit of land was uh, a problem. And so um, uh, there was a huge homeless population, and they basically camped out on the common because there wasn't adequate housing. There wasn't any place for anybody to go. And here you can actually see the extension of the shoreline. Uh, the dark, almost black, dark green is, of course, uh, the original configuration of the shoreline. And then you see it moving all the way up to um, the last landfill projects that date only to 1995. Um, now, a lot of this came from cutting down these glacial hills. Uh, there were three of them that formed Beacon Hill, and um, it was mostly sand and gravel, so it was ready-made for landfill projects. And here you see this big area, this estuary off the Charles River. This is Cambridge over here uh, that was a tidal flat known as Back Bay, and that's sort of the locus of our discussion this morning. So there we see uh, the smoothing of uh, the lowering of Beacon Hill. And I should mention that um, uh, here on the common, this parcel that we see right here was owned by a man named John Hancock, who was very proud of his signature. So he wrote it very large on the Declaration of Independence. And at his death, in his will, he left his estate to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for the purpose of constructing a new state capitol building to replace this old State House that was down here. Uh, they, the old State House is still there. It was, it's actually very historic. It's now actually a metro station. 
subway station on the blue line. Um, and it was historic because it was the site of the so-called Boston Massacre, where the uh, Declaration of Independence was actually smuggled out of Philadelphia. It was written in Philadelphia and then smuggled out of Philadelphia, a copy of it, and was read to the crowd assembled in front of the State House uh, in 1776 on the eve of the war uh, with England. Uh, these were technically called glacial moraines, and they were known as Trimount. Today there's a very famous street um, which runs, um, well, let me go back, which runs right here called Tremont Street. It circles around, changes names about right here to Cambridge Street, and then crosses on a bridge over to East Cambridge uh, and Memorial Drive. So that's the um, State House. It was designed by an architect named Charles Bullfinch. Um, the dome, by the way, is wooden because um, there was no one in the United States at the time, 1830, that knew how to build a masonry dome. So uh, it was built out of wood, roofed, and then covered with gold leaf. Um, well, this area, this estuary, the old common was converted into a um, park, a kind of public park, uh, as it is today. And um, all these people, especially the Irish, were living here. And um, all the sort of Boston Brahmins, the original British inhabitants who were living here on Beacon Hill, I should mention here that uh, Bullfinch then bought up some of the land that had been smoothed, and he um, began a series of speculative housing uh, ventures himself, investing his own money in it. He went bankrupt doing it, uh, but nonetheless, it produced um, a very famous residential district within the city, still known as Beacon Hill uh, to this day. You'll also notice that there was a causeway constructed here, which extended this street, known as Beacon Street, across over here to the mainland uh, that we see here in the town of Roxbury. Uh, these were separate townships that eventually merged into a large metropolitan structure. So when we talk about Boston, we're, it's like Atlanta. We're talking about a fairly small area, jurisdiction, political jurisdiction in the middle of what is essentially a very large, uh, three to four million people, large metropolitan area that's really comprised of a series of these smaller New England towns that all sort of grew together. Um, this is actually a detail map then showing uh, that causeway, the extension of Beacon Street out across the Back Bay. This is the area known as Beacon Hill. There's the State House right there. And the common, as you'll notice, they've started uh, planting trees on it. And this is known as Frog Pond, which freezes in the winter and they ice skate on it. The, uh, so a lot of homeless people were camped out here, and it was a problem because of the sewage and other things that was collecting, garbage collecting here. And so um, they raised money, actually the people who lived here, took up a collection and gave it to the city for the purpose of filling all of this in to create a public garden with the idea that a new city hall would be built on that landfill site. And there we actually see it in its current configuration with the State House here. That's the original building that we see still embedded in the modern building. Beacon Hill here overlooking the common. And then here's Frog Pond. And the ocean originally came to right here in Back Bay. The housing projects that Bullfinch developed were modeled on the residential squares of London. This one, uh, known as Lewisburg Square, uh, was built out between 1820 and 1840. And it takes its cue from the residential squares of the west end of London. In 1845, other than cemeteries and the common, it was the only, quote, park uh, 
in the city, but it was not public. Note the fence around it that you see right here, because like Bedford Square, these people, by the way, Ted Kennedy lives in one of these right here. Um, one of these, the owners here um, actually have a key that allow them to go over there and let their dogs go to the bathroom and kids play and so on. So um, here's the area that was filled in then that formed the public gardens. You can see the causeway of Beacon Street. This is in 1854, and this is the beginning then of the public gardens and of the filling in of the back bay. This is a photograph taken from the top of Beacon Hill, the top of the State House, looking out toward that causeway that extended out. This is the public garden that we see here. The common is right here in this, which is Charles Street, running right across here, was the original shoreline that opened out onto um, this large embayment called Back Bay. There were a series of plans done for the filling of Back Bay. Um, most of them were pretty bizarre. This is certainly one of the more, the stranger ones, which fortunately never got built, which would have turned the Charles River into an enormous lake. There we see the fresh water of the Charles entering into this sort of uh, lake, which would have been subject to tidal action. And uh, here we actually see then streets, an island in the center, one called the Elysian Fields, and then uh, these streets and rail lines which were intended to connect uh, the mainland back over here in Roxbury back over to the city of Boston. Um, the, um, the actual, in 1848, the state of Massachusetts declared that the city of Boston did not own the water in the back bay that it was commonly held by the state itself. Uh, a compromise was reached where the state would construct the dams and bulkheads, provide the gravel and sand for the landfill, and the city would then be granted ownership of the improved blocks. Now, this is actually an incredible thing because what they did was they took public money and they built a series of blocks beginning here um, with the causeway, not the causeway, but the dam, the bulkhead, that then backfilled for the public gardens, and then they built a second block, a second one here, backfill this, and then they deeded these over to the city so that the, the sale of this land on a speculative basis then provided the funds for the construction of the next one. So the city acted as a real estate developer, in effect uh, building out a series of streets beginning with Arlington Street uh, here, which then... Um, they go A, B, C, D. I can't remember all of the names. Clarendon is the C Street. D is Dartmouth. E is Exeter. F, uh, I cannot remember. G, Gloucester Street, and so forth. This is the plan that was ultimately adopted with the idea that a new city hall would be built right here. Never got built. Uh, it was a very simple plan. Berkeley is the B Street. There is uh, Clarendon Street. And here is um, um, let's see, D, Dartmouth. This was to be called Commonwealth Avenue and then simply extended in every one of these subdivisions on the axis where the location of the new city hall was proposed to be built. And over uh, about four or five decades, uh, this whole area was filled in this way, flat as a pancake. There we see it. That's the common. There's the public gardens. That's Arlington Street running across here, Commonwealth Avenue, and then the crossing streets here, Berkeley, Clarendon, Dartmouth, and so forth. Uh, the public garden, the city hall never got built, but um, the um, public garden uh, based loosely on uh, the plan of St. James Park in London by John Nash, remodeled by John Nash with this sort of serpentine lake. Um, the buildings that you see in the background, including I.M. Pei's Hancock Tower, as you see right here, was actually built on landfill. It was out originally in the middle of a tidal estuary. There we see the uh, public gardens. That's Charles Street. 
Uh, this is called Lower Beacon Hill. This is the Charles River as it, in its final configuration. And there we see the extension of Commonwealth Avenue. The location of City Hall, because it never got built, ultimately was important because it terminated this grand vista down Com Ave. And so they um, erected an equestrian statue of George Washington in imitation of Marcus Aurelius at the Campidoglio. There we see it. It's really an extraordinary street, 200 feet wide with this sort of park in the middle. There it is under construction. You can see the landfill operations continuing, extending down here. Now, there was a stream back here known as the Fenway. The word fins, um, actually, the red line that you see in the small map is actually the original shoreline. Um, so they projected this out over water, basically, in a marshland. Um, the, um, the word fins is uh, an archaic English word that means marsh, mud and marsh, the Finlands uh, around East Anglia, around Cambridge. Um, there is Commonwealth Avenue in 2006. Quite beautiful this time of year. Uh, a sort of repository of memory, various important people in the history of the state, the history of Boston, are memorialized along Commonwealth Avenue with these townhouses or terrace houses, quite large actually, uh, facing out onto uh, Commonwealth Avenue. The whole ensemble, as I said, is 200 feet wide. It is an enormously wide street. And here we are looking back at the site of City Hall where the statue of George Washington was ultimately constructed and then leads us from there through the common up to um, conditioned here by um, the State House. So this is what it looks like today from the top of the Hancock Tower. You see these blocks of townhouses that were built. Churches were constructed typically on the corners. Um, it's interesting that they tried to, today if you were subdividing something out in suburban Atlanta, you would probably have a swim tennis community. Here they, it's interesting, they built churches to try to attract people. They gave land to various congregations to build uh, new churches. I think that's kind of interesting. It tells you the social importance of the church at this point in time as a social institution. Um, each of these blocks were split by alleys. There's the church. Split by alleys. These are public alleys, and they're simply numbered. One, two, three, four, five. I think there are 300 of them. Um, certain streets developed as commercial retail streets, such as Newberry Street here, and others remained residential. Most of these big houses today have been subdivided into apartments. There are a lot of college students in Boston, and a lot of them rent these one- and two-bedroom apartments um, for a pretty substantial sum of money, actually, um, living in Back Bay. This is a church that burned and was replaced. The steeple did not burn. It was replaced by Paul Rudolph in about 1964. This is Beacon Street today. The red line that you see uh, in the small map right here is where you're viewing. And this is Commonwealth Avenue as it exists today. So this extended all the way from the public garden and the common, the state house, which is kind of right there, all the way down until it met the Fenway. And there we see the Fenway, which was um, had a stream in the middle of it, a tidal stream known as the Muddy River. Nice romantic title. <laughs> um, now, the problem was this was flat and there was inadequate sewage, sewers, sewerage. 
And so the, the stuff in the pipe is called sewage. The system of pipes is called sewerage. It's kind of interesting. Um, so they, based on the same principle as the old mill pond, they um, created a floodgate here, which they would open on the incoming tide in the Charles, which at this point was saline. And this would flood back up in here and then wait for the tide to go out. And then they would open the gate, and it would allow all of this flushing action out of the muddy river out into the Charles, and then the tide would carry it out into the ocean. There we actually see um, the whole ensemble from the State House and the Common to the Public Gardens, uh, all the way down Commonwealth Avenue uh, to this floodgate that we see right here, and then here, the fins along the Muddy River. Uh, is a detail of this that we see right here. And this right here is that floodgate. Uh, these drawings, you can see F.L. Olmsted, landscape architects, J.P. Davis, civil engineer. Um, it's interesting that these drawings, uh, when you look at the original drawings, actually are labeled sanitary improvements to the muddy river. But um, as Olmsted often did, he, he, had, he was a man of considerable vision. And uh, so he seized upon the idea of creating a new kind of street, which would, the first time it was, this term was ever used, called a parkway, so that the center of the um, center following the Muddy River would actually be um, a series of parks, and then these streets, the Fenway, would run along. That's the Fenway right there. And thus, Fenway Park, where the Red Sox just captured the World Series, um, is actually named after the street. There we see it today. The idea was that you would then build public buildings. This is the Museum of Fine Arts that would front onto this parkway, and that the parkway would ultimately terminate here Oops, in a large rural park known as Franklin Park, named after Benjamin Franklin. This is called the Arbor Way. It connected the Arnold Arboretum um, back to um, Jamaica Pond and then back over here along the Fenway until it hooked up to Commonwealth Avenue and terminated here on the public space in front of the Capitol sort of American equivalent of the Campidoglio, in a sense. No, they were, there you see them, they're pretty substantial. Um, I mean, at 5 o'clock, this is chock-a-block with traffic. But there weren't enough public buildings. I mean, the Museum of Fine Arts was one, but there weren't that many more so much of it became uh, residential. And in fact, during World War I, um, they leased, the city leased sections of uh, this piece of land here to the people who lived in these apartments for the princely sum of a dollar a year so that they could have what were called victory gardens where they could grow their own food. And you walk through it today, and it's sort of interesting because some of them are still growing, you know, tomatoes and cucumbers and squash and so forth. And others have become sort of bourgeois. You actually sort of have a picnic table and a TV, you know, and a generator and lounge chairs. And people are sort of out there grilling hamburgers, having a backyard cookout in their little patch of land over in this public park. Um, this was an idea that... Bernard Schumi picked up on in the Parc de la Villette in his plan, what he called a film strip. He claimed to have invented it, but clearly there was a precedent almost 100 years older here in the Fenway. So this is the Fenway. That's what we're looking at right here. The whole ensemble was then a parkway. Now, again, this is something that is entirely man-made. This is... Um, under construction, 
the muddy river of sanitary improvements under construction in the 1870s and 1880s, and there it is today. The collaborating architect was a young man named H.H. Uh, Richardson, who designed all the bridges and the bridge abutments and the architectural features along the, the fence. There it is under construction. There's the same location today. And that's one of the bridges designed by Richardson. There you see the Prudential Center sort of popping up on the horizon in the middle of what was Back Bay. Well, as you move on out, you were terminated then by this large rural park, the Franklin Park. And uh, originally, the idea was that you would drive your carriage through the park. And then there was this large mall here that Olmsted on the drawing is labeled the, the greeting this social space where a series of haha -ha walls constructed along either side of it contained indigenous New England uh, animals. And you have deer and moose and other kinds of things sort of contained here. And later, this whole concept was not really appreciated, and so the Boston Parks Department converted it into the zoo, complete with geodesic domes and Bengal tigers and lions and elephants. Uh, I think it was such a poetic notion that you would sort of walk along here on a Sunday afternoon and you could sort of um, get a sense of the rural New England landscape uh, in its native condition uh, by having these animals, Deer Park and so forth. You'll see labeled on the drawing if you could see it. That says Deer Park right there. This is what it looks like today, the large sort of open undesignated area here was converted into a public golf course. There we see one of those geodesic domes <laughs> type things that I was referring to. And this is what's left today uh, of the greeting. So the idea was that you would then drive your carriage through here and around and out on your way back. There you see the greeting. And there you see Deer Park, Deer Park, and you had this overlook across this field. This originally had sheep grazing on it. And there you can see where the, the Arbor Way, which is part of the Fenway extension, uh, came directly into the, um, into the um, park. Now, this parkway uh, is an extraordinary street. Um, as I said, it's kind of the American equivalent of something like the Champs-Élysées. Uh, it's a new kind of street, and I always ask my students rhetorically, um, where's the architecture in this? And they say, well, that. And I'll say, no, that's a building. Um, and I'll say, well, that. And I'll say, no, that's a house. The architecture is in this tectonic division of territory that divides programmatic function, promenade, driveway. Uh, this is for riding your horses. This is for carriage, for pleasure travel. There you see it today. Still functions as a major commuting route um, into and out of uh, the city. It's interesting, I think, that he juxtaposes a house with a church. If we go back to sort of what we were talking about, you know, with this transition from the... Um, residential square from the piazza of Renaissance Rome, for example, uh, Counter-Reformation Rome, which was always focused on public buildings, churches, other kinds of institutional uses. And then suddenly at Richelieu, we see a market occupying the same position opposite the church on the public square. And here we see, uh, in a sense, a new kind of public square, which is this elongated roadway um, in which a church, you know, varying land uses can flesh out this uh, constitutional order here that is being subdivided by a series of uh, programmatic functions. Building lots of 200 feet and then this pedestrian promenade and this driveway, then rapid traffic, street for traffic, uh, 
and so forth, but not dependent upon any specific symbolic architectural element. Thus, there's a kind of displacement from the building to the ground, in a sense, of how we signify uh, public institutions, so that this becomes an institution in and of itself. Now, there were precedents for all of this. Uh, we know clearly what this one was in the public garden, Marcus Aurelius, and uh, we know about the public park, Central Park in New York, also designed by Olmsted and Vaux. Um, Commonwealth Avenue, clearly the Champs Elysees, or what is now Avenue Foch in Paris, uh, at this time called the Avenue Imperatrice, um, named after the Empress, the wife of Napoleon III. Um, what was missing was what do you do with these interstitial spaces? Uh, again, not enough public buildings to go around. So um, Olmsted had been born um, as the sixth generation son of a Connecticut River Valley merchant in, outside of Hartford, Connecticut. His mother had died when he was three. His father, not think, thinking that he could not care for the son properly, sort of uh, farmed him out, so to speak, to a series of congregational um, ministers, which inculcated in him a distaste for um, organized religion. But he would later attempt an autobiography, which was never completed. But in that unfinished autobiography, he um, talked about these New England towns that he became quite familiar with as a boy, and there were two things, I think, that about that that are um, significant here. The first is that he said his happiest times were when his father would come for a visit and would take him on carriage rides through the New England countryside. Um, and I think, to some degree, that's what he's trying to replicate here into public service, uh, the experience of, 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 of that. Um, the second is that he wrote about how even though he would be miserable in these congregational ministers' homes, um, he found the towns themselves and the town's people to be um, extremely warm and caring, he, that he, he always felt that he was part of a community. And so the question is how to get a handle on... Um, this rapidly growing metropolitan area. And I think he seized upon the New England town as a model for um, how you might organize this territory and subdivide it to, to replicate to some degree uh, the feeling of community that uh, he had felt as a boy growing up in a series of these New England towns. Um, so the piece that's missing, for which there was no real precedent, was the planned garden suburb. The first of these, designed by Olmsted and Vaux in 1869 outside of Chicago, was Riverside, Illinois, which is to this day an incorporated town like Decatur or Marietta or Sandy Springs or, or something like that. The second one is right here in Atlanta that I want to use as an example, Ansley Park which was uh, built between 1902 and 1904, um, designed by an engineer named Solon Z. Ruff. I have no idea if he ever designed anything else in his entire life. He had worked for the Olmsted firm as its chief surveyor, both on Druid Hills here in Atlanta and on the Biltmore House in um, in. Um, Asheville, North Carolina. So if we look then at um, the planned garden suburb, it's really an idealized form of rural life. Um, so if we think for a minute here about the Roman villa and uh, what um, Pliny the Younger wrote in, about his Tuscan villa, um, and uh, he says, you know, 
It's, uh, I can enjoy profound peace there, uh, more comfort, fewer cares. I need never wear a formal toga, and there are no neighbors to disturb me. Everywhere there is peace and quiet, which adds as much to the place as the clear sky and the pure air. There I enjoy the best of health, both mental and physical, for I keep my mind in training with work and body with hunting. This otium, this um, productive leisure that was the um, ideal of the Roman villa. Well, what if you could mass produce that otium for, um, at a small price by recreating, based on these New England towns, a sort of secularized version of that that could be tied by rail or parkway back to um, the city. And thus, you, if you were a doctor, a lawyer, a merchant, a chief, you could live here, and you could come down and take the train into Chicago and um, go about your daily business and then return again to the peace and quiet of this idealized rural environment in which your income is not derived from um, grazing cattle or raising vegetables, but rather um, it's attached to the city. Um, so Olmsted wrote in 1871 in his address to the American Social Science Association that this was the major problem that metropolitan growth faced. How do we combine he goes to go on to say, cities provide great things, educational opportunities, employment, uh, you know, better hospitals, and so on. Uh, but they're crowded, and they're noisy, and they stink, and they're, they're dirty. Um, so it's a problem in terms of trying to enjoy the best of health, both mental and physical. And uh, so he wrote here that he said, it thus becomes evident that... Um, the present outward tendency of town populations is not so much an ebb as a higher rise of the same flood, the end of which must not be a sacrifice of urban conveniences, but their combination with the special charms and substantial advantages of the rural conditions of life. Hence, a series of neighborhoods of a peculiar character is already growing up in close relation with all large towns, and though many of these are as yet little better than rude, overdressed villages or fragmentary half-made towns, it can hardly be questioned that already they are to be found among them the most attractive, the most refined, and the most soundly wholesome forms of domestic life, and the best application of the arts of civilization to which mankind has yet attained. So if you could then create these sort of villages in which you, you could have um, what plenty um, wanted in a small way here, um, close enough to a place of employment, uh, you would then um, sort of, with that, you could then figure out, well, how do you then fill in these kind of undeveloped interstitial spaces over here in Brookline and over here in Roxbury and over here in Jamaica Plain, so on and so forth. Um, so, the outward tendency, there's a push and a pull, and the outward tendency that he's describing is the push that's coming from these kinds of urban conditions, such as we see here in this photograph of Pittsburgh, and then if you could create um, these planned suburban towns, um, you could then have a pull that would be better for children to grow up in, and so on and so forth, combining the best of urban life with the best of rural life. That is what he was after. Now, I think this resonates all the way into the present. This is an advertisement that I saw in the um, Golden, Colorado, Denver newspaper for, for a suburban development called of Denver called Wellington in 2002. So I borrowed my brother-in-law's car and we rode out to find Wellington. This is Wellington in reality. This is Wellington as it was idealized in the advertisement in the newspaper. <laughs> the kind of neighborhood you thought disappeared a hundred years ago. It's interesting how they name things in these kinds of places, too. They're, they're all, 
sort of names like Old Flintlock Trace or Spinnaker Common or something which is sort of evoking um, a pre-industrial condition, right? Now, the first of these, interestingly enough, was Blaise Hamlet outside of um, Bristol in the UK, Bristol, England, and it was designed by John Nash at the same time that he is designing Regent Street and Regent's Park. So all of that Regency-style neoclassical, stripped-down neoclassicism that we see uh, with Regent Street here is actually a sort of a, a series of kind of fairly archaic-looking cottages that were built around this kind of common area that we see here. This was built, actually, um, for retired pensioners of John Scandrett Harford, a wealthy banker and landowner of Blaze Castle and Blaze Estates. People who were my age or a little older had no longer could um, drive the cows home every night because of their rheumatoid arthritis or their bad back. So they went on a pension, and um, they got one of these cottages that he built for them. And then the grandchildren come to visit at Halloween and you trick-or-treat, I guess. I don't know. That's sort of an American thing. But, um, you know, the British don't carve pumpkins. They carve turnips. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Well, um, Olmsted was not the first. In fact, there was uh, one called Le Vaisonnet, built outside of Paris, same year as Riverside. Um, and this one preceded it outside of New York, Llewellyn Park, New Jersey. Tuxedo Park is another one where everybody would go to this clubhouse for dinner dressed in a type of suit that became, that took the name, Tuxedo. Um, so smart, you know, everybody, you want to look like Cary Grant when you put one of those things on. Um, this one, Llewellyn Park, though, by Alexander Jackson Davis, if we look at this, it has none of the sort of collective order that we see in Riverside. Instead, it's just a series of fairly large residential estate lots. Um, or Rochelle Park, which was in New Rochelle, New York, by Nathan Barrett, uh, which um, has some sort of intent at, at an urban design structure. But um, again, it's a series of lots sort of um, fit into a parcel of land tied to the rail line that we see here, the New Haven and Hartford, New York line of the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. And we compare that then to Riverside, we see quite a difference where um, these blocks, even though they are amoeba shaped, uh, these blocks all sort of feed the side streets into these main streets and if we were to zoom in on this, we would see this is a large park along the Des Plaines River. It's actually how it's pronounced. These smaller areas that we see here, 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 are labeled commons. Commons. That's what alerted me first um, to the fact that he was drawing upon his experience of these New England towns, pre-industrial New England towns in the 1820s. Um, for inspiration. Further then, if we compare, say, the plan of Sudbury, Massachusetts, here, with Ansley Park here in New York, we see, uh, designed by Solon Z. Ruff, we see um, this remarkable resemblance of uh, town lots or house lots that are grouped around this in this case, a cow common, in this case, something called Wynn Park, W-I-N-N, -N, named after a family. Um, this is Peachtree Street, that we see right here. Today, the High Museum sits right here. This is now the office of Perkins and Will. Um, we'll look at this in some greater detail in a minute. So I'm proposing that the Plan Garden suburb as the sort of third leg on the stool 
of reactions to aimed at reforming the um, industrial city. In this case, was a rejection of the industrial city in favor of a pre-industrial landscape, and that the model was um, something like Lexington, Massachusetts. Quite beautiful, in fact. Um, now, at the center of this, there was a town, an actual town, with a city hall, stores, shops, a library, a school. Uh, the symbol of the town was a water tower and the rail depot designed by William LeBaron Jenny. Um, the developer went bankrupt before it could be completed, and this part was never built. So if you go to Google Earth, you will only see this part and this part. Now, if we look at this, what we have is actually a series of amoeba-shaped blocks. They are not orthogonal, but they are blocks, fairly small blocks. It is not a dendritic system. And there's an advantage to this in that it can adjust as it meets other kinds of geometries later on. This is 1869. The view southwest along Long Common Road. That's right here. That's Long Common Road right there. And if you look at that, I mean, that looks like something might have been built in 1980 or something somewhere, you know, outside of Atlanta. I mean, even as concrete roll curb and gutter. Riverside became, in addition to the fact that it's um, in and of itself, it is an extraordinary thing. Um, also a place where a lot of wealthy people moved and hired a lot of famous architects, including Lewis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright, to design houses for themselves. This is along uh, Shinstone Road, the regular spacing of, of trees, these oak trees. Um, actually was, in a way, a, an attempt to define the street as a kind of autonomous space of its own. And there we see uh, William LeBaron Jenny's odd water tower. I, I think that's not his finest hour. Um, <laughs> and there's the town center as it is today. And then here we see some of those houses by Wright, uh, this by uh, Sullivan. These were more typical. That's possibly a Sears Roebuck home. Um, but there are a lot of well-known buildings that were built in Riverside. Now, Ansley Park, in some way, is more Olmsteadian than Druid Hills, which was designed by the Olmsted firm late in the old man's life. He, he uh, suffered from um, dementia, and um, he turned the firm over to his sons, um, Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr., uh, known as Rick, and his brother, half-brother, actually, John C. Olmsted. Uh, but Ruff had worked for the Olmsted firm on Druid Hills, and he was hired by the developer here, Edwin Ansley, who modestly named his subdivision after himself. <laughs> you uh, often will see streets and suburban developments all over metropolitan Atlanta that have names like Shirley Place and James Way, and you discover that the developer named all the streets after his children and his grandchildren. So everybody got a street. It's kind of sweet in a way. Um, well, this is the plan that Ruff produced. And uh, again, Peachtree Street that we see right here. This is now occupied by First Presbyterian Church, the Reed House condominiums. And at this point in time, 1904, um, Peachtree Street was a single-family residential street. Um, if you zero in on these, it's interesting to see how they sold the lots. The lots were priced by the linear feet of frontage onto the street. And it sort of makes sense. It's like I've invested, if I'm the developer, a certain amount of money in building the street, putting in sewer and water, and so therefore you are buying a portion of that. 
Right? Later, this would change. The city realized that fair market value would produce more revenue, and so they it all shifted to a kind of open market. This is the uh, original plan. You'll notice, too, how Piedmont Park over here, the streets were aligned originally at the entrances to Piedmont Park, the idea being that if you lived over in Virginia Highland, you would drive through the park on your way to work, um, wherever that might be, over somewhere down here, down Peachtree Street. Uh, this is the site of Colony Square today. This is the AT&T building. This is the High Museum on this lot. The MARTA station, Art Center MARTA station, is in this block that we see right here. Now, if we look at this, um, it becomes immediately apparent that Peachtree Street, over time, developed into uh, office and institutional uses. Um, so this system, the urban strategy, of splitting the block with an alley in London is based on, again, the West End of London and the Muse system in London, which operated exactly the same way, allowing what is on one side of the block to remain residential and what is on the other side of the block, the land uses to change in extraordinary ways to an extraordinary degree. There we see a detail of it. Uh, there's actually up here an alley that runs behind these houses uh, off of 16th and 17th streets. Now, people drive through this neighborhood today and they just assume that somehow these brilliant designers were able to insert streets and lots and houses in there without cutting down a single tree. Now, that's not the case. Here it is under construction on the top. And I've tried to replicate as close as I possibly could the actual present view to the uh, view as it was under construction. This is actually, as I said, Edwin Ansley was forced to declare bankruptcy, and the lots were sold at public auction in 1904. This is the first of those auctions. It's amazing. People just gathered out there on the site, and they put certain lots up, and people bid on them, and they got them. Amazing. Um, this is more or less where that is today. This hill that we see up here is over here on the right. Uh, if you move a little further down the street, though, the trees block the view, so you can't really tell where you are. So it meant what this structure meant was that this could remain residential and that all of these houses could be converted at some point, these lots, into office, institutional, and commercial uses like that. Now, if we think about this, even though the geometric form is different than Bedford Square, which is all orthogonal, um, what we have is exactly the same urban structure, this sort of public park in the center things facing onto it, um, and then this alley splitting down the back, allowing this to convert to one thing and this to convert to the other. Thus, Tottenham Court Road, sort of um, we see down here, sort of equivalent to um, Peachtree, and then Tavistock Mews, which splits, allowing the residential terrace houses to remain intact, even though now they're often occupied by lawyers and dentists and architects and others. Um, this, the structure is the same. Now, I said residential. It's important. This is to understand that this neighborhood is built before zoning. So you could not do this today. The orange is all of the um, multifamily structures that are embedded within what is perceived to be a wealthy single-family neighborhood. Uh, I'm very familiar with this because that's my house right there for the last 36 years. So um, 
my neighbor, my neighbors today would be horrified if somebody came in and proposed to build townhouses on on some of these right here. Um, but there they are, and they work just fine. And uh, again, I'm struck by the fact that the um, how New England the these um, sort of sub suburbs are. Uh, if we look on the upper right, that is a house built in 1690. Just to put this in context, Louis XIV was on the throne of France at Versailles when that house was constructed in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, Lexington, which is one town closer to uh, Boston than Concord, uh, assumed its current form in 1740. This is Druid Hills here. This house built about 1920. And the Ardmore suburb here off of Peachtree, um, directly opposite the Cathedral of St. Philip, built in 1980, uh, which, in which this sort of skin is in imitation of this nostalgic sort of pre-industrial world. But if you were to rip all the brick off down to the studs and to look, look at x-ray this house, you would see that, in fact, it's one of the most modern things ever constructed. It's filled with Romax, you know, um, all kinds of dryer vents, electricity, cable TV, everything known to man um, into the house, which is nonetheless attempting to evoke a rural pre-industrial feel, similar to Lexington or Concord. Questions? Is that clear? Pretty much? Okay. Um, I'm going to send out an email.